My name is John Klein. And my name is Carol Klein. We want to offer you a very warm welcome to worship service today. God is at work among us all. We're excited about all the things God has been doing and will do for this congregation and the world. Hello everyone and welcome to St. Mark's Sacramento for Celebration Worship. It's good that you're here today and I'm really glad that you have chosen to be part of the St. Mark's community today, whether you live here in Sacramento or somewhere else across the country or across the world. It has been really heartwarming to know how many people are joining us from different places and it enhances our St. Mark's family. Today is the last Sunday of the Easter season, but we're having a series that runs through the months of May and June with the title, All In, with a question mark, All In. And today's specific theme is listening to the stories, listening to the stories. Stories have great power and great wisdom within them. I'll be saying some more in a few moments. First, uh, Mark Slaughter will be leading us in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. 
and then Joanna Coca will be reading our scripture reading. Readings from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterwards, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage rose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of the, that country, who set him into the field to feed pigs. He longed to eat his field from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hand have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received the son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in, but the father came out and begged him. He answered his father, look, I've served you all these years and I've never disobeyed your instruction. Yet, you have never given me as much as a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned after gobbling up your estate on prostitute, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. 
he was lost and is and is found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Growing up in the north of England, I was in a small town that was about 70 miles away from Nottingham. Nottingham, of course, famous for Robin Hood. And the stories of Robin Hood, I really loved. I could tell you all about Maid Marian and Friar Tuck and the Sheriff of Nottingham and Alan Dale and Will Scarlet and, and of course, Little John. I could tell you all of those stories. The same is true of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Very important stories for me as, as a child, and I particularly loved Merlin. Both of these sets of stories uh, are stories that really are moral tales. They're encouraging people as they retell them to live a moral life and to care for people who are oppressed. They are great stories. These stories have had a lot of influence down the centuries. And there's a sense in which these stories are true, but it's doubtful whether any of them have any basis in historical fact. There is great debate about whether uh, Robin Hood is a composite, of, and, and the same with King Arthur, of various characters in English history. A story can be true even when it's historically groundless. Accuracy isn't the point of a story. Truth is. And those, I think we sometimes get them mixed up. Jesus was a storyteller, and he gave his followers a series of stories that would help them to figure out their own paths of faith. We tend to think of Jesus as being a preacher and a teacher, but I think it's helpful to think of him as a, a storyteller because he's telling the stories about God and a God of moral action. His stories are not interested in sharing history, rather they contain powerful nuggets of truth. For example, there are probably plenty of men who went down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very treacherous road and still is. And the story is of a guy who got mugged on the road. Jesus used the image of the man lying there on the road, injured and bloodied, to tell a story. First a priest, then a Levite. Two religious guys come and they look at the man in trouble and they pass by on the other side. And then a guy who happens to be from the neighboring country of Samaria came past and he became the role model for compassion and care. Jesus wasn't preaching against the religious establishment or anything like that. Rather, he was inviting his hearers to put themselves into that story and see where they belonged, to find themselves in the story. Sadly, in our more judgmental Western world, we have tended to see it as a moral story, saying that you should be like the Samaritan and not like the other people in the story. We are encouraged by Jesus to explore the story within ourselves and see what it says to us. So let's turn now to the powerful story that Joanna just read for us. Alongside the famous Good Samaritan story, this story is normally referred to as the story of the prodigal son. It, it's interesting to me that it is referred to in that way because obviously there are three very key characters and why focus on that one and it's because in our culture, this parable has become a, a moral story of, of how you're supposed to behave and how you're not supposed to behave. It's a story with great power, and the fact that it's on the lips of Jesus doesn't detract from the power of the story itself. And it may well have existed before Jesus. Jesus may just have picked it up to use it as a teaching tool. There are many details missing from this story, uh, the one I like to point out is the fact that the mother absolutely doesn't appear at all. Uh, she is completely absent from the story. And I sort of see her standing there, wringing her hands, saying, oh, geez, men, or boys again. The father and the two sons are center stage. 
and without devolving into stereotypes, they do seem to be behaving in particularly male ways. As in any good myths, there are lots of ways to interpret the story, but let me try describing the three main characters. Uh, the parable might more accurately be described as the parable of the forgiving father. And the most powerful truth that comes through maybe is that this dad loved his boys even when they misbehaved and were fighting. And he worked hard as a go-between to get them to communicate their truths to each other. The father is accepting, forgiving, and loving in spite of maybe being manipulated and even abused by his two sons. The older son is the classic firstborn, totally re reliable, the rock on which his dad depended, hardworking and serious. He's inflexible and forgiving, unforgiving of his younger brother. And then there's the young, youngest guy. He's a classic lastborn, if ever there was one used to being the center of attention, but totally insecure in who he is. In his favor, he saw that his life wasn't going anywhere and decided to do something about it and changed his lifestyle. Uh, he decided he wanted to go out and experience the world, but he blew it and he messed up this one big opportunity that his inheritance had afforded him. So he has to go home, groveling in front of his father. Is he totally shocked when his father receives him so warmly and even throws a party to celebrate his return? And is he disappointed in his older brother's response, so churlish, so mean-spirited, really? We don't know. And of course, we know nothing about the servants in this story. And a reminder, this is a story uh, these are not historical figures. We can only begin to imagine the emotions, uh, the, 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 the misreadings of the situation. I, I wonder, too, whether those servants had strong opinions about what was going on. I wonder if they just thought it was too much of a storm in a teacup, or as we sometimes say today, that the issues these three men were facing were what you might call a first world problem. They had much bigger problems to deal with themselves. So as you share in this story and draw yourself into this story, I invite you to make it your story and find yourself in all the characters in the story and see what they tell you about yourself. See what they say about you and your attitudes. Do you find yourself identifying a lot with the grace-filled, loving parent who is probably a little naive but is always ready to see the best in people? And when do you see yourself as the young renegade who wants to find yourself, even if it turns out to be expensive, both in terms of money and in terms of goodwill with your relatives? And when do you find yourself being that dependable one, reliable but smug and over-serious? Would you have felt free to join the party if you were that person? Would you be ready to truly celebrate? The story ends, you may have noticed, with Jesus putting words into the Father's mouth. This brother of yours was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost and is found. That's plenty of reason to celebrate. As I said, for many people in our culture, Jesus is a moralistic, judging, preaching parent who keeps on insisting, insisting on pointing out how we've failed, how we've done things wrong, how we've sinned. You and I have to re-engineer the world's understanding of Jesus. Jesus was a storyteller. And that's a playful activity as well as a profound activity. Jesus is a shaman. He's a griot. He made people laugh as he told his stories. And he invited people to explore themselves, to go deep into who they are as they heard the story. He invited people to explore 
deeper realities of themselves than they normally looked at. Move beyond their daily routine. And I believe Jesus in these stories today calls us to do the same. And we should encourage others to do just that. This parable speaks about the primacy of relationships over situations. They were family after all. Nothing breaks the relationships of a family that is truly built on love. Nothing in all creation, says Paul, can separate us from the love of God. And yet so many families allow differences and disagreements to become a focus of pain and separation that rarely gets healed. Please note that in verse 20, verse 20 is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, and it really doesn't come through in the English translation. It says that the father was moved with compassion. The, the word... It, in the original language, is just an overwhelming emotion, an overwhelming of feeling of love and celebration, of total acceptance and delight in the moment. His emotional state was completely on cloud nine. There was no thinking, there was no debating, it was instinctive love. Please note, that the story ends without telling us whether the big brother went in to join the party. Personally, I like to think that he got over his smugness and followed his father's lead in sharing in the celebration of unconditional love. But there's no guarantee either for him or for you and me that we can do this or certainly do it easily. In his 1980 commencement address at Spelman College, Howard Thurman told the graduates, you are the only you that has ever lived. Your idiom is the only idiom of its kind in all of existence. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. Wow. You are the only you that has ever lived. So explore the depths of you and allow the stories to lead you there. Those stories of Jesus invite us all to look inside ourselves and seek for God's grace, for growth in compassion and grace. We're invited to share the stories with other people as part of our effort to invite them to hear the sound of the genuine in themselves. You're not calling them to be saved for some great religious cause, but to be saved from themselves so that they can find a new freedom to be honest and true and loving and grace-filled. A reminder of another story. You are a seed planter. And please remember in the story, some of the seeds fall on rocks, some of them on the path, some in the weeds, and some, of course, fall on the fertile ground where they grow and bear fruit. Please be a storyteller and invite everyone you know into the story. And recognize, be prepared, that many of the seeds won't take root, but there will be great joy in heaven over those that do when people find themselves in the grace and the love of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join me in a time of prayer together. Let's be quiet in God's presence. And as we move through the prayers, when I say, God of grace, would you please respond, hear our prayer. God of grace, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have planted a story, many stories in our hearts and souls. Enable us to keep exploring who we are so that we can make your compassion your justice, real in the world. 
God of grace, hear our prayer. And we pray for the St. Mark's community nearby and afar, that we may all live our lives in your love and grace in such a way that others hear their story reflected in the story of faith. May we be good listeners. May we always be ready to heal, to understand, to forgive, and to celebrate. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for the peoples of the world and their leaders, countries in crisis and at war, we pray especially for the people of India as the COVID pandemic continues to do such damage. We pray for doctors and community leaders, for peace builders and aid workers, and all who seek to bring hope to the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Give wisdom, we pray, to those in authority in every land, and give to all peoples a desire for righteousness and peace, with the will to work together in trust, to seek the common good, and to share with justice the resources of the earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray today for those known to us who need our prayers, and we name them now before you. And we pray for those on the church's prayer list, those who are sick, those who are grieving, those who are going through a difficult season in their lives for whatever reason. God of grace, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal, merciful God, all who are in sorrow, need, anxiety, or sickness. And give us the faith and the confidence we need to respond to their needs when we can. And so we say together the prayer of Jesus. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now Jean and Jim Strathdee will lead us all in singing Deep in Our Hearts.
as this worship service comes to a close, I share a benediction from the Lakota tradition. Wakan Tanka, great mystery. Teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intuition, my inner knowing, the senses of my body, the blessings of my spirit. Teach me to trust these things so that I may enter my sacred space and love beyond my fear and thus walk in balance with the patting of each glorious sun.